colleagues. We want to begin our work in the session, The Roads to War in Southeastern Europe. Dobro jutro, dame i gospodo. Počet ćemo s radom u našoj sekciji Putevi do rata u jugoistočnoj Evropi. I want to ask the lecturers, Mr. Nikola Samadžić, Marko Atila Hoare, Dalibor Jovanovski and Maros Benharek. Are they here? Please sit down in the first row, if it's possible. Okay. In this case, I ask Mr. Nikola Samadžić, I apologize for being obliged to sit, as I cannot reach the microphone otherwise. Um, I will speak in English. Uh, anyone interested can get my article in Serbian, Bosnian, etc., whatever it is. Um, as we all know, the First World War began in Southeastern Europe and originated from a local conflict. Will you close the door, please? Thank you. While the contemporaries were unable to predict the scope and dynamics of a domino effect that threatened to link the events, in political and economic contexts of imperialism and the second industrial revolution, Southeastern Europe has been an obstacle to the interests of Germany, Austria and Russia, impatient to reach the supreme power level in international order. Invisibly to the contemporaries, a general struggle to establish a new distribution of forces were leading to a path of self-destruction. Partly Ottoman, partly Habsburg and once partly Venetian province, the Balkans have since long been the subject of bad-tempered attitudes of European powers. Almost the entire century international relations were disturbed only in conflicts that managed to remain local, even when first-rate particip participant powers have been evolved. In broad historical context, economic, technological, cultural and urban development, at the turn of the centuries was not followed by identical progress in democracy or international relations. The tragic stream of impetuous decisions was revealing an increasing complexity of mutual misunderstandings and was clear enough a tendency to resolve disputes by force in an increasingly complex, thus sensitive structure of international relations, further disrupted by aligning along inconsistent and ruthless alliances. The Balkan Wars in 1912 and 13 indicate the general deadlock, while the future futility in fatal collapse could not be perceived. In the meantime, the second degree forces as Austria, Hungary, Germany and Russia were beginning to consider war as an acceptable surrogate to diplomacy which accounted with its crawling activities during the previous decades for less meaningful and effective. The conflict of Austria, Hungary and Serbia that contributed to the outbreak of the First World War took place at the peak of a composite political crisis that took place on the periphery of the major political and economic systems. Up to 1867, Serbia established full control over the cities by expulsion of the Turkish crew. That same year, the Habsburg monarchy established a new constitutional order. The new dynamics of international relations emerged due to the retraction of Britain and Russia in European continental re relations, trapped in the Eastern question paradigm. Thus, even small local incidents acquired general significance. The layout of Balkan's huge malignancy 
was still just an exotic decoration of the historical mainstream, which sometimes tended to conceal big decisions and interests. Interpretations of the Sarajevo assassinations from 1914 are not accidentally extended to the entire width of the contemporary historical stage. The emergence of new states in the second half of the 19th century has further complicated the international relations. Unification of Italy and Germany contributed to the new imperial rivalries. New peripheral states, whose independence were, was recognized in 1878, encouraged the nationalisms whose crisis potentials have provoked international order deprived of effective regulatory mechanisms in that matter. Nationalisms have grown primarily in the areas of metastatic feudalism and perhaps due to the failure of the mid-century liberal revolutions. In 1878, the actual state of order was confirmed and the legitimist reaction era was definitely closed. Autonomist movements in Bosnia and Herzegovina with origins in deep and specific national and social stratification, somewhat calmed and improved thanks to the institutional changes brought by the Austro-Hungarian occupation. Relations of Austria and Serbia from 1867 to 1914 have gradually decayed to the detriment of both sides. The mutual positive historical experience as noted in peace treaties concluded by Austria and Turkey in Karlovitz and during the, the, 18th, the 18th century, was becoming irrelevant. These contracts were not only early documents of international law, but, but also stimulus for the economic development and cross-border cooperation, while discerning interest reciprocity of new Habsburg order in Southeastern Europe and Serbian National Revolution. The last decades of the 19th century also rejected the legacy of Romanticism that associated the distant folk groups and historical period, while adopting the intrasigious paradigm of Slavic and Germanic world. Balkan nations were seeking international support by emphasizing all their ethnic peculiarities and fatal historical justice. Their ethnic and territorial interests were usually mutually exclusive in disputed territories and areas of infinitely complex ethnic relations, no matter whether these relations in the near or distant uh, historical perspective were real or imaginary. Ethnic issues have become a topic of political, scientific and pseudo-scientific campaigns and manipulation. The Ottoman Empire staggered to recover from the economic recession and the occasional peripheral disintegration. Balkan national movements revealed the misunderstanding and even the non-acceptance of modernization and democratization, etc., etc. Cataclysm in the first fall was the consequence of political irres irresponsibility elites of elites already or unable to adapt uh, in Serbian case the Serbian interests and destiny to the relations of international relations and the possibilities of an undeveloped undevelop an, an and predominantly agrarian society. The militarization of Serbian politics was one of the outcomes of inter institutional weakness, while influential politicians and important public personalities supported or even encouraged the aggressive foreign, foreign policy. Simultaneously, the economic and cultural development of the Serbian community in Bosnia and Herzegovina under Austrian rule was seriously disturbing the violent expansionist tendencies in official and circuit cycles of Serbian politics. In a need, if there is a need of a very specific example, 
and relatively well known to us ex-Yugoslavs, the intentional deceptions of Serbian-Bosnian writer Petr Kocic, who vividly portrayed the Habsburg administration's bureaucratic cruelty, seemed to have revived the very similar popular memories of the Austrian rule in Belgrade and Serbia during the 18th century. During the years preceding the war, events in southeastern Europe were accelerated within the unfortunate chronicle of irrational feelings and actions. Irresponsible personalities in Serbian politics and military challenged the Austro-Hungarian rule in Bosnia and Herzegovina without hesitation or violence, devoid of consciousness of, collect of collective consequences that actually sub subsequently occurred. Serbia was apparently missing time and prudence in the need to consider the winning Balkan wars in enlightenment of co casualties, losses and short term, both in ethnic and international relations. In July crisis, Serbia and Austria revealed the absence of good faith. The idea of the Austrian Empire survival had additionally burdened Vienna and also Berlin, thus preventing a subtle, a subtle adjustment to the realities. In the whirlwind of international and, and regional relations, official and public Serbia has ignored or even despised the long-term importance of relatively rapid modernization of Bosnia and Herzegovina under Austrian occupation and rule. That process, although was taking, was taking place in political and ruling framework considered as hostile, was revealing possibilities of a broad regional prosperity, particularly in relation to the previous period of Ottoman disintegration, and especially was encouraging the Serbian Croatian capacities, including the influence from the neighborhood. Uh, the logic of an era that I was analyzing from 1878 to 1914 became obsolete in the in international crisis that preceded the outbreak of the First World War. The official irresponsibility of both Serbia and Austria-Hungary also characterized all other participants involved. Although, at the very beginnings, the war has not been supposed to take so many human and material losses. Not by incident, Sarajevo has remained a symbol and the victim of the processes that preceded the First World War and throughout the 20th century becoming, at the end, one of its most tragic and eloquent symbols. My personal relation to the First World War was by my grandfather, Vaso Samrđić, who was a distinguished citizen of Sarajevo. He went with his two brothers to, to Serbia uh, to fight on, on Serbian sides, and two of his brothers were killed. So we remained very few uh, in my family. Um, I'm proud of his courage and my family courage, the same time have cha has changed and today Serbia, Austria and Bosnia are not Serbia, Austria, Bosnia from the century that preceded. I also had a chance to meet uh, Vaso Čubrilović, one of uh, the participants in, uh, in, in Sarajevo accident in 28 June in 1914. I, I remember him as a uh, very educated, intelligent, but also arrogant, authoritarian, and of course pro-Russian, pro-Soviet personality. And uh, I came here in good faith, but uh, also feel it sad. And, uh, not to discourage, of course, by the fact that uh, not much of our colleagues and institutions were ready and willing to take place in this wonderful conference. Uh, thank you very much, and I hope that you will get the opportunity to read my article if you need it at all. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Samadzic. It's, uh, it's a, a great pleasure for us uh, <coughs> that you come here. <coughs> I, please, uh, Mr. Marco Attila Hoare. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at uh, the, the roots of the Serbo-Austrian War of, of um, uh, 1914, and um, um, one of the things I've been interested in is the long-term structural dynamics in Serbian history, which might have led to this uh, to this conflict. Um, often, when talking about the First World War, um, you know, there's such a Groundbreaking, such a sort of momentous conflict, had such a huge impact on world history that it's in forgotten the extent to which it began as a, as a Balkan War, um, and we're no, we're familiar with the fact that it began as you know that it expanded to become an imperial conflict involving Britain, France, Russia, Austria, Hungary, Germany, fighting over their uh, conflicting imperial interests. But it did begin as a sort of a Balkan War between two Balkan states, Austria, Hungary. Um, and Serbia, and in what, the most recent extensive examination of this conflict by um, uh, Christopher Clark of Cambridge University, um, he actually does give due attention to, to this factor. Um, so you need to look at the sort of the, the relationship between Serbia and Austria-Hungary to understand um, how the war arose. And these were two states that had, for decades, uh, enjoyed a very close and complex uh, relationship. Um, now, there weren't equals, of course. Um, Austria-Hungary was, in some sense, one of the great European powers. Uh, Serbia was a new uh, Balkan state, a, a, regional, a regional power. Uh, so it's not entirely fair to see them as co-equal, as equally responsible. Um, but nor is it true that Serbia was simply a complete passive victim in this conflict. Um, so it's more a question of two uneven powers, each of which had uh, predatory designs uh, on the other one. Um, and although I want to stress at the start that, you know, I consider Austria-Hungary to bear the greater share of responsibility rather than Serbia for the outbreak of this conflict, uh, nevertheless what I'm looking at here really are the sort of structural factors that would explain why Serbia found itself uh, in, at war with Austria-Hungary in 1914. Um, now, it wasn't, a, it wasn't an inevitable war, if you like, and there had always been Serbian politicians who had supported collaboration with uh, Austria-Hungary. Um, you have a strong, or perhaps a dominant interpretation in the former Yugoslavia and perhaps in Serbia today, uh, which will view Serbia's war effort against Austria-Hungary as a kind of natural, a natural outcome of Serbia's own struggle for national, liberal, national uh, liberation and unification. Um, but it could equally be seen as a kind of a, a completely unnecessary, unnecessary uh, disaster. Um, and it has to be remembered again that the, the outcome of 1918, when Austria-Hungary collapsed and Serbia uh, emerged on the winning side and was able to establish a united Yugoslav state, that wasn't foreordained. Um, you know, look, look, going back a few months, it could, have, it could be seen that uh, the war was a disaster for Serbia, in which perhaps by some accounts, perhaps 20% of its population died. It was militarily occupied and crushed by Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria. Um, and the fact that ultimately Serbia emerged on the winning side in the war was kind of an accident, if you like. Um, United States intervened to bring about an Allied victory, and the Allied victory enabled Serbia to be, to be liberated. Um, so it was a national disaster which Serbia experienced in the First World War, which you know, had a sort of unexpected happy ending for Serbia's leadership. Um, so I want to sort of go back and try and look, look at the roots of this, this tragedy. Um, uh, ever since it emerged in the first half of the 19th century as a new modern national state, um, Serbia lived under the shadow of Austria or of Austria-Hungary. 
and there was a sort of link between the two states through the, the Serbs of Aust Austria. Um, the Serbs of Austria had played a major role in developing Serbia as a, as a state through its developing its cultural um, and other uh, cultural educational institutions, its um, armed forces, and so forth, to make up the lack of native um, educated Serbian people. Um, and for long periods of the 19th century, uh, Serbia was a satellite of Austria-Hungary, particularly in the reign of Prince Alexander Karadjordjevic in the 1850s, and again under the Obrenovich kings in the 1880s and 1890s. And during the revolutions of 1848 and 1849, uh, Serbia sent volunteers to fight on the Habsburg side against the Hungarians. Uh, when uh, when um, Serbia emerged as an independent state in 1878, it did so as a satellite and ally of Austria-Hungary. Um, of course, as you, I'm sure people are aware, that uh, Russia at this point favoured Bulgaria and abandoned Serbia, so Serbia turned towards Austria-Hungary. Um, now, the, the Serbian army then expanded following independence in 1878 uh, as the project of the very pro-Austrian uh, ruler, Milan Obrenovic. And the Austrian orientation remained strong among the Serbian officer corps all the way up until the 20th century. Um, Vienna viewed sort of control of the Serbia as a national interest and was prepared to use any degree of um, uh, bullying or coercion, ultimately military force, to keep Serbia within its own sphere of influence. Um, but at the same time, Serbia's own expansionist tendencies created the latent tension between it and Austria-Hungary. And Gerashenin's famous blueprint or plan of 1848, uh, 1844, um, envisaged Serbia's expansion into, into Bosnia-Herzegovina. Um, but then when Austria-Hungary occupied Bosnia-Herzegovina in 1878, it created the kind of conflict between the two states. So from the point of view of Serbian politicians, you had a question of for or against the Austrian orientation. And those who favoured uh, more collaboration with Austria-Hungary were prepared to look, up, look away from Bosnia-Herzegovina and look southwards for expansion into Kosovo, into what's today Kosovo, and Macedonia. Um, Austria-Hungary would permit this only so far as the um, as Serbia remained a kind of dependable ally. Um, now, um, King Milan Obrenovic and his successor, King Alexander, well, King Milan Obrenovic was the most pro-Austrian of Serbian rulers, and his son Alexander Obrenovic was a bit more ambivalent. Um, but on the other hand, you had his opposition force in Serbia, the Radical Party, the People's Radical Party under Nikola Pašić, which was much more ideologically pro-Russian. Uh, pro and these two wings represent the two sides of Serbia, the two Serbias, if you like, the, sort of the modern Serbia of the bureaucracy, the army and the monarchy, and um, which was in this period sort of pro-Austrian pro or pro-Austro-Hungarian, and the kind of the Serbia of the peasantry represented by the radical party, Nikola Pašić, which was pro-Russian, uh, pro to sort of simplify a little bit. Um, so the question of... Uh, for or against an Austrian orientation was not just a foreign policy question, it was deeply related to Serbia's internal, internal politics. Um, now, um, the internal developments um, in the start of the 20th century meant that this sort of balance between a pro-Austrian monarchy and a sort of pro-Serbian opposition, if you like, pro-Russian opposition, uh, was res resolved in such a way that... Um, the pro-Austrian monarchy was, was destroyed and, and um, the new kind of power sharing arrangement in Serbia was between the pro-Russian radicals and the new faction, the officer corps, uh, the, the, the conspirators who had killed King Alexander in 1903, uh, who also ended up being uh, anti-Austro-Hungarian. So you had a kind of power sharing arrangement between two factions who were in rivalry with each other, both kind of oriented towards um, hostility towards Austria-Hungary. Um, and this kind of relationship to some extent explains how Austria-Hungary found itself, or how Serbia found itself at war with Austria-Hungary in 1914. So the sort of paradox of Serbia's road to war is that it was the work of these um, members of his Black Hand organization, Unification or Death, under Dmitrievic Apis, who were children of a sort of officer corps that had traditionally been Austrian oriented. Um, the um, Black Hand organization grew out of the conspirators who had murdered 
King Alexander in 1903. Um, but as eminent Serbian statesman Vladan Djordjevic uh, remarked, uh, Alexander's real killer was his own father, King Milan. Uh, Milan had been the commander of a Serbian army um, under Alexander, um, as a former king who came back to lead the Serbian army. Uh, and um, it was his opposition to Alexander's ma marriage to Queen Draga which set the ball of conspiracy rolling um, among the officer corps. Um, the um, main purpose of the Serbian army under the Obrenovich regime had been to keep the regime in power, to keep the peasants down, to control the radical party. Um, and the army had um, been used by King Milan to crush the major rebellion that broke out, uh, the Timok uprising in 1883. Um, so this army was ultimately geared towards internal repression against the regime's enemies. Um, but as a kind of, um, if you like, a sort of overproduction of officers, um, the regime generated too many officers who couldn't find an outlet for their own ambitions in the regime. And then under King um, Alexander, after he succeeded uh, Milan, uh, the officer corps' position declined and their wages went into arrears and they felt uh, frustrated. And this kind of structural factors then led to the, to the conspiracy against Alexander and then in turn to the um, formation of unification or death, the Black Hand. Um, so this traditional then fissure in Serbian political life between the radicals and the officers and the monarchy um, was then replaced by a sort of fissure between two partners, the Black Hand and the Radicals. Um, and the Black Hand um, continued, it sort of inherited this form of contempt to the Radicals and the peasants and pursued a kind of a policy towards, um, uh, towards the Serbian government in the period after 1903 and towards the outside world that dragged uh, Serbia uh, in, into war. Um, so although... Nikola Pašić and his radicals, they were oriented towards Russia and, and they, towards friendship with, with France. Nevertheless, they hadn't wanted war to break out in 1914, but they were dragged into war, if you like, by the actions of this uh, extremist circle in the officer corps under the Black Hand. Uh, they weren't able to control their own army and border guards and could not prevent the assassination uh, from taking place. Um, now, um, in his um, later years, King Alexander Brenovich had moved Serbia away from his father's pro-Austrian policy and began to try and pursue a policy of, of sort of alternating between Russian and Austrian orientations, balancing between the two parties. So the Austro-Hungarians were ready to accept the coup against him. Um, and this coup d'etat of 1903 was the work largely of a pro-Austrian pro elite. So members of the conspiracy that overthrew, overthrew Alexander were men like Jovan Atanaskovic and Jovan Abokumovic, pro-Austrian, pro-Habsburg um, officials. Um, yet, ironically, it was the conspiracy then gave birth to the Black Hand movement that dragged Serbia uh, into war. Um, one of the sort of structural conflicts that then emerged from this conspiracy was a conflict between the older conspirators um, under people like um, Atanaskovic and um, Damian Popovic, um, Alexander Mashin, and the younger ones under Dmitry Vajapis, um, those who were sort of voice of Tankosage, those who were sort of become founders of the Black, of the black Hand. Um, and the older ones had this kind of traditional pro-Austrian line, which then became apparent during the, the gun controversy, when a question arose of whether Serbia should buy its, its um, arms, its artillery from the Austrian firm of, of Škoda or the, the French firm of Schneider Crusoe. Um, and these older conspirators uh, were sort of inclined towards the Austrian, Austrian option, but were then pushed out by um, pressure from the younger ones under Apis, uh, by the sort of the, the government under Nikola Pašić, um, sort of the radicals, and by um, diplomatic pressure from, from the British. So this kind of traditional pro-Austrian part of the elite was then pushed, pushed to the sidelines, and you had then this kind of uh, duality between the... Um, emerging group under Apis and, and the radicals under uh, Nikola uh, Pašić. Um, so you had these, these two centers of power which then worked in, in competition to one another, helping to move, move Austria um, towards Serbia towards war with, with Austria-Hungary. Um, 
Now, obviously, bear in mind that uh, Pashich, his own strategy, although he was himself Russian-oriented, um, he had also supported the southward expansion into Macedonia, Kosovo, and following the Balkan Wars of 1912 to 1913, um, he favoured a long period of, sort of peace to try and uh, assimilate this new territory, which was ethnically Macedonian, mostly Macedonian and Albanian, to assimilate it into the Serbian, Serbian state. But then he found his policy being undercut by these extremists in the Black Hand who were you know, trying to sort of provoke conflict uh, with Austria-Hungary. Um, and this assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand was part of his policies of, of APIS, his extremist circle of sort of pursuing expansion through, through terrorism and also undercutting the civilian leadership of, of Serbia, for which they had, they had um, no respect. Um, so I just want to sort of, to sort of, round, to sort of round that up. I mean, Serbia, the official Serbian government in 1914 did not want war with Austria-Hungary, but because of his peculiarity of having this army with this sort of essentially independent power base under this extremist organization, they were pushed into conflict, and that should be seen as the culmination of a long-term development in Serbian history. Thank you. Thank you very much. different roads to the First World War, and uh, one of the most complicated roads is... Uh, one of the most complicated roads to war had Greece. Uh, <coughs> please, Mr. Dalibor Ivanovsky. He's not here. He's not here. <coughs> uh, in this case, uh, please, uh, Mr. Maros Meriarek, come here. So, dear colleagues, uh, dear conference uh, participants, uh, I'm really honored I can uh, uh, describe my, uh, my research on that uh, on occasion of this beautiful conference. So, the title of my presentation is Foreign Policy of Serbia towards Bosnia and Herzegovina before the breakup of the First World War. So, uh, Consider it as as a part of the of the bigger section. So I will try to, to skip uh, unnecessary uh, parts. So so the the uh, my whole article was uh, uh, further uh, divided into several sections. So the first the introductions uh, aims of the article and brief analysis of historiography. Then, uh, and the most important for today is the issue of uh, Serbo-Bosnian relations, uh, some kind of uh, methodological aspects. Uh, then, uh, the next part was devoted to Serbian national programs towards uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, during the, the 19th uh, century. And the most prominent and the most important, uh, which I analyzed and tried to uh, put the, the, the greatest uh, focus was uh, Nachetanje by uh, Ilya uh, Garashanin. Then, uh, the last part, uh, secret societies and their links uh, with Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, bibliography. Uh, as the, the, the uh, few words on the, the last, uh, last part or, or last chapter, uh, it's... Uh, I considered uh, it really uh, crucial to 
uh, describe uh, uh, societies or uh, uh, mainly uh, unification or death, uh, young Bosnia, uh, national defense, because uh, uh, while analyzing uh, Slovak historiography, uh, recent and, uh, and older also, and uh, Slovak uh, textbooks, uh, even on, uh, on primary or secondary level, there exists uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, how to say, cliches and, uh, uh, and uh, myths uh, which are connected to, uh, to those uh, mentioned uh, organizations. So, uh, let's uh, start with, uh, I'll skip this. So, uh, the, the problem or the, the issue of Serbo Bosnian relations uh, is quite uh, complicated, uh, uh, quite complicated and complex uh, topic. So, uh, first of all, uh, it's necessary to describe the, consti uh, the constitutional uh, status of both uh, of both uh, countries. So, uh, as we all know, uh, Serbia was in 1878 uh, still formally under the sovereignty of Ottoman Sultan as well. Uh, as Bosnia and Herzegovina itself, although uh, Serbian principality from uh, 1815 progressed its own, its own uh, autonomous development, since Bosnia, after small uh, revolts in, uh, in the first part and second of the uh, 19th century, uh, remained an uh, integral part of Ottoman Empire, and then after the Berlin Congress, upon the basis of the uh, 25th article of the Treaty of Berlin, passed continuously under the realm of Austria-Hungary, uh, where it remained until 18, uh, 1918. And uh, uh, from 1908, uh, it has become an integral part of Habsburg monarchy as condominium Bosnia and Herzegovina managed jointly by the two parts of dual monarchy by Austria and, uh, and Hungary. So uh, the mutual relations, uh, relations between or relationships between Serbia and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, can be viewed uh, through the phenomenon of the uh, Eastern crisis which took place in uh, 1875 uh, until 1878 when uh, we can find an open support of, uh, for Serbs living in Bosnia and Herzegovina by the Principality. Then, uh, the, the, the second complex uh, is the annexion uh, crisis or Bosnian or First uh, Balkan crisis, uh, when the support from uh, Serbia side had been declared only through diplomatic channels. For example, uh, as I uh, written back to the Eastern Crisis, uh, we can find the proclamation of uh, Milan Obrenovic from 18th June that soon expi uh, expire one year from the day when our brothers in Bosnia and Herzegovina revolted to defend themselves uh, themselves against the highest violence and arbitrariness. Uh, the second uh, proclamation, uh, which is called to my beloved nation, uh, Again, I called you to arms on 1st December last year uh, for the second time. I called you not only on behalf of our oppressed brothers, but also on behalf of independence of our dear country. So, uh, it uh, implies that he considered the, the, the whole, uh, the whole uh, I would say, uh, also uh, the Bosnia and, and Serb li Serbs living in Bosnia is a part of, uh, of one nation and probably uh, one, one state. So, uh, after uh, Berlin Congress, after 1878, uh, we could really hardly find some, some kind of this, uh, uh, such words used in official uh, declarations of uh, uh, Serbian dynasty. So, for example, I compared it with, with a, a lot of, uh, for example, with one from 1888 uh, called uh, Serbs. So, uh, also, uh, also, I would say interesting is the Montenegrin uh, attitude during the, the, the crisis where uh, Nicola I addressed the inhabitants of Herzegovina 
in June 1876 by, by words. Uh, again, that uh, I will read just the part of it. The treasure chest of memories of our rich history and glorious flagship, flagship of the Serbian nation, march under my flag. So again, uh, there's the, the, the same uh, rhetoric, the, the same, uh, or nearly the, the same words used in the, in the proclamation by the Montenegrin uh, ruler. So then, uh, in the second one, uh, Montenegrin's blood of our night had, has been spilled on the battlefields of Herzegovina because we cannot silently watch our brothers and do not help them. So, uh, and then he, he, he used also the, the, the uh, how to say, uh, very common uh, and uh, repeated uh, notion of Kosovo, Kosovo battle. So these are examples of uh, of it. So, uh, the next point is uh, uh, it's uh, necessary to answer that it is very important to distinguish official support from the Serbian dynasties and governments and on the other hand secret organization that operated outside the formal structures of the, of the government. Uh, and the, the, the third part, political activities of Serbs within Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, itself, because sometimes in, uh, in, uh, in historiography you may find a lot of uh, myths and, and, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of authors uh, cannot uh, uh, divide the boundaries between, uh, between these three, uh, three uh, sections. So, uh, also the, the Serbo-Bosnian relationships uh, between the uh, breakup of the First World War uh, could be seen uh, in the purely Serbian view, so unification within a single state without territories where Serbs created minor minority, although the most uh, programs which are analyzed uh, later avoid this argument. Uh, then, uh, very complex and very complicated and controversial uh, greater Serbian or, or Great Serbian view, so the claim for territories without Serbian uh, majority. Also, again, uh, you may find a lot of uh, a lot of cliches, uh, not only in contemporary uh, in uh, in uh, contemporary historiography, but also in historical documents, in historical uh, in historical books. Uh, for example. Uh, uh, I can just uh, quote one uh, one example. So it's the one of the uh, one of the newer uh, newer uh, Slovak and Hungarian books written on uh, on history of Austria Hungary, where it's written that nationalists dreaming about Greater Serbia didn't consider the territory to be liberated territory uh, of the Neretva River Valley. So uh, sometimes it's it's. Uh, Analyze without further context and uh, and uh, the basic uh, analysis of uh, of uh, sources. <coughs> then uh, the next uh, view could be Yugoslav. So linking southern Slavs without ethnic or confessional determination, however, uh, declared by Gabriel Princip himself and and many uh, many many others. Uh, so uh, the. Common relationships uh, or relations can be divided into several historical stages. So uh, I, I tried to, to elaborate some kind of a system of uh, of this uh, of this uh, chronology. So from 1804 to 1875, uh, it's like a preparation phase of national program of first period of non-intervention, uh, whereas Serbia didn't have. Uh, uh, enough or sufficient foreign policy power uh, to be able to actively pursue its foreign policy towards Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, although in this uh, period many national programs were created um, which uh, considered Bosnia and Herzegovina as part of the Serbian ethnic uh, area. So uh, the next part, uh, the next uh, stage is uh, uh, it's connected with the with the beginning of Eastern crisis, and it it lasts until 1878 or 1881. Uh, so the period of uh, let's say inter 
intervention where service attitude to compatriots in Bosnia and Herzegovina was promoted on a new level uh, before the occupation by Austria-Hungary. Uh, also, uh, there uh, appeared the first Serbian-Turkish war uh, and uh, uh, many other uh, important uh, events uh, took place. So, uh, the Congress of Berlin uh, marked the end of the inter interference in the affairs of Bosnia and Herzegovina from Serbia since it became part of the Habsburg monarchy and uh, as it was said today also uh, that the policy of Serbia ha had to be uh, directed towards old Serbia, so-called old Serbia, Macedonia, Kosovo, Northern Albania. Uh, and uh, the important uh, turning point was the, the signing of uh, the secret treaty in June 1881. And uh, the last part, uh, or the last stage, uh, third from uh, 1903 to 1908 uh, or 13. Uh, so the uh, important uh, event uh, came in 1903, it was May overthrow, the change of uh, uh, of ruling dynasty and uh, also the foreign policy and uh, orientation uh, change. Although uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina remained firmly outside the Serbian active uh, active role. So uh, just maybe I, I don't know if we if we have. A whole little. Okay, so uh, as I said, I also analyzed uh, Serbian national programs. Uh, the most important was uh, Nacitanje and uh, uh, and the role of uh, of uh, Serbian uh, secret uh, uh, societies, uh, uh, which uh, uh, which role was. Uh, was directed towards uh, unification with with, uh, with Serbia within the sing uh, within the single uh, sing uh, single nation. So just the uh, sources I, I used, and thank you very much for your attention. We have uh, enough time for discussion, and uh, I, I can imagine this discussion as a dialogue also. And of course, uh, everybody in, in this room can ask lecturers. Uh, <coughs> yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I can. Uh, we have enough time for discussion, and uh, I can imagine this discussion as a dialogue. And of course, uh, everybody in this room uh, can ask lecturers. In uh, the title of our session was Roads to War in Southeastern Europe, but uh, uh, the, it, we are, we, uh, the lecturers were speaking only about uh, Serbia and Austria-Hungary, about other uh, Southeastern European countries, uh, uh, not. I think that in in uh, in this region, in at the beginning of the 20th century, there was many uh, conflicts and uh, war conflicts too, but nobody can imagine the dimensions of the First World War. Uh, when Austria-Hungary declared war to Serbia. Uh, Serbian Prime Minister, uh, the session of the Serbian government said said that Austria-Hungary declared war to us. It it will be the finish of Austria. But uh, we can say that he predicted the disintegration of Austria-Hungary. But I think that uh, he he wasn't sure in this solution. <coughs> And uh, certainly, he cannot know uh, how great dimensions of suffering are expected to Serbia. The, this, the great dimension of the 
demographic collapse. I think it is the it is the the <coughs> the very very expensive price uh, Serbia paid for the First World War. Please. Um, I would like uh, to ask a question about. Um, I would like yeah, to ask. We're not going to have people, the panelists, the up yeah. in front. I mean, who are we asking mm. questions? Yes, please come here. <laughs> I would like uh, to address my question to the last uh, panelist because you, you dealt uh, most with the secret uh, societies which were active in Bosnia uh, from, from the times of the, of the Great Eastern Crisis up until uh, the, the beginning, of, beginning of the First World War. Um, I think uh, in this Great Eastern Crisis also there are already uh, secret, um, secret societies active in, in Bosnia which were in a way um, supported or um, the infrastructure was provided from Serbia or not. But, uh, even in that period there is already this dilemma. Um, I would like to ask you if you, if you see during this whole period from the Eastern Christ, uh, Great Eastern Crisis until the First World War some continuity in these secret societies. Mm, well, you mean uh, towards uh uh, towards Bosnia and Herzegovina? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, the fact is that uh, uh, Serbs uh, of, uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, were for a um, uh, long period without uh, formal support of uh, of the of the official government so uh they they had to you know uh to uh to build closer uh, ties uh with uh, for example uh secret uh, societies and also uh they had to build the the, the closer ties with uh, the serbs uh, not only in in uh, serbian principality and then uh, and later kingdom it, itself but also with uh, with Serbs in uh, in uh, Vojvodina and other other regions. So I would say that uh, this was the quite uh, crucial fact that uh, affected the uh, the emergence and uh, the cooperation within the the, the secret uh, societies. Uh, as as mentioned, for example, uh, Young Bosnia and uh, the Black Hand as uh, was also discussed uh, today. I would like to ask a follow-up question because maybe I was not clear enough. Um, like the, the setting up of these secret societies, uh, in some ways, was directly uh, the Serbian government was involved. For example, Garashini, um, he organized a, a network of informants throughout Bosnia. Yes. Later in the Great right. Eastern Crisis, Jovan Ristic, as the Serbian Prime Minister and Foreign Minister, organized this network. And there is always this, this ambiguity of we organize the network, uh, spread ideas, Later something happens, and then okay, it was not officially supported. Is there, in this this question of, of um, also the, the the responsibility of, of the Serbian government for um, for the actions of Mala Bosna? Um, could we see a continuity in this this ambiguity between spreading ideas, spreading a network, informing, training, uh, educating uh, Bosnian Serbs? And later, not taking responsibility for the actions of these uh, these people. Well, it's uh, uh, well. Uh, you said a very, uh, very good remark that uh, also Garashanin uh, uh, tried to elaborate the system of agents and uh, uh, support. And uh, he, although it was, uh, uh, it was. Uh, uh, secret draft. It, it wasn't officially published later, uh, much later. So uh, I would say that this uh, ambiguity is continued through the, the whole the whole period. As uh, it's maybe sometimes it's uh, it's uh, more uh, let's say comfortable to to build a secret network and then okay, it's 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 not our it's not our. Uh, you know, it's not our it's not our business. But uh, 
I can agree with you absolutely. I must intervene because we, we must consider this, uh, this topic in, 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 in broader framework. First, for example, Austria supported secret Serbian organizations in the 18th century. Then national revolutions in Balkans uh, became, uh, began through a network of secret organizations of, of Serbs, Greeks, their, uh, their relations with Italy are, are very important. That's, that's how Italy became a, a single nation in, in, in 19th century. Although the differences uh, between the north, south, and regions were much bigger than differences between Croats, uh, Bosnians, Montenegrins, etc., etc., etc. I mean, Yugoslavs are, are more. Uh, uh, Closer to each other than than Italians, French, uh, French, etc., etc. Uh, no more than one third of French could uh, understand the Marseillaise at the end of uh, of 18th century, and we could understand us on Balkans in uh, in much in in much broader uh, broader space. Um, so it's uh, it's it's very it's it's very complicated. But it was the uh, 18th and 19th century, so the role of secret organization must not be uh, considered as much important at the beginning of the 20th century, as the decisions were made by politicians or by military. And uh, secret organizations were just trouble, troubles maker, makers. I mean, the assassination in Sarajevo was, 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 was just a trouble. It, 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 uh, it just happened. It was uh, it was the very beginning, but it was not important because everybody was preparing to 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 go to war. The French thought that they will win the war and that uh, the war will endure two months, not four years, etc., etc. So it's uh, it's much complicated question, uh, and it, it it's important. But as the states grew through. 19th century, getting their independence and institutions, the, these groups were becoming less and less important. Although the assassination era was of much importance. Uh, I'd like to ask a question um, and uh, first make a comment and. Uh, uh, say that uh, thank you all three of you for the presentations. I thought they were remarkably broad in scope and and uh, deep temporally, um, and that uh, all of you gave us a, a real great overview uh, of the topics that you were covering. And Professor Sumerich, um I want to thank you in particular for your very personal statement of uh, your family experience and. Um, also to say that the rest of us are glad that you are here, uh, e even if so many of your colleagues uh, did not come. Uh, I think we share the, your hope that um, uh, more uh, historians will participate uh, in activities that uh, pertain to this area, uh, as well as yourself. Um, my question is mainly directed to Marco. Um, You've described these radical shifts in the foreign policy uh, relations between Serbia and Austria throughout the, the 19th century. Um, what I wonder is how deep did these changes go in society, in, in, in the, the two societies concerned? Did the average person on the streets of Belgrade know the difference uh, between when they were allied with Austria and when they were uh, hostile to it? Or was this really just a matter of diplomatic uh, alignments in, in, the, uh, in the chambers of uh, diplomatic conversations? Thank you. Well, I, th I think it, it's more than just a question of, of diplomatic um, sort of uh, shifts. I mean, this, this sort of fissure in Serbian politics is, is quite fundamental to the country's history. So. The fact that you had um, in, with the sort of Serbian uprisings, um, culminating the establishment of an autonomous Serbia under Prince Milos, a sort of new Serbia 
emerging a new, a new elite, a new, a new sort of layer over, over the peasantry, which then kind of created the, came to be seen as kind of sort of parasitical or sort of oppressive, uh, oppressor of the ordinary uh, Serbian people, um, and which then, then in turn provoked a kind of a reaction among the sort of peasantry, a kind of series of peasant uprisings, which then found expression through the formation of the Radical Party and these opposition Serbian elements uh, who tended to see the sort of the, the Serbian, new Serbian elite as being kind of an alien imposition on Serbia which defied its natural traditions. So first the, the liberals in the sort of late 18, um, 1840s and 50s uh, who um, really sort of tried, looked, tried to sort of develop a kind of weak, Serbian weak tradition of sort of seeing this sort of elite as alien uh, followed by a kind of a, uh, the radicals who are kind of the, the more or looked at the peasantry as a sort, of, sort of real repository of the sort of Serbian uh, national spirit. Um, so these these divisions sort of then were kind of quite I I important. Um, and um, for the, sort of the, the radicals, this opposition to uh, to um, Austria-Hungary, this sort of pro-Russian or, or nation, was quite sort of a fundamental to their kind of ideology. And that was the sort of the party which had a kind of um, uh, enjoy the loyalty, the mass of, of the Serbian. Uh, peasant uh, population, whereas again, sort of, uh, um, I'm afraid to stress, this sort of Serbian military elite was kind of grew up under like Austro-Hungarian uh, umbrella. So there was, I think, um, among the more educated people, a sort of sense in which, which these two Serbias represent something like, more than just diplomatic um, alignments. Um, now, I think um, from the point of view of ordinary Serbian people, peasant, peasants, they, they didn't have a lot of affection or loyalty to uh, the monarchs. The prince, later King Milan, was not a popular monarch, neither was uh, King Alexander. Um, so they tended to take their lead from the, the, radical, the radical party. Um, and um, so when the radicals came to so, so your hand to power by the coup in 1903 and began to reorient Serbia uh, to more sort of directly to a more sort of overtly to a kind of sort of anti-Austro-Hungarian, more pro-Russian, pro-French policy. That then did represent more than just the diplomatic realignment, actually a sort of shift in the nature of Serbia, representing a sort of, a sort of like coming to age of a sort of the Serbia of the radicals of the people, um, a, a, as it were. Um, and then again, sort of this sort of shift within the officer court to a sort of anti-Austrian position, you know, sort of manifested by this sort of shift to the younger conspirators under Apis and, and his his group also represented sort of, sort of seismic uh, shifts. So I would sort of, sort of stress that this, this alignment then was really much more than just a diplomatic realignment, but a sort of culmination of these of these long term trends. I'm Boyan Alexo. Um, first, maybe. Uh, continuation of uh, uh, comment on, on Donia's comment. Unfortunately, we know very little what the average Joe or Dragan or Milorad on Belgrade Street thought. And part of the problem is also this conference and uh, not a solution because of our fascination with uh, high politics, diplomacy and uh, violence. There are some uh, ethnographic uh, research from central Serbia uh, where the first Balkan war uh, came as a total surprise how uninformed uh, the peasants were and shocked but then war did make difference so the major influence was uh, war on nationalism and not the other way around yeah, so war brought nationalism and not nationalism war, or if one can simplify it by like this. And I'm sorry, I, I wanted to comment actually on Marco's uh, presentation. And I, uh, it's not a criticism because I will face the same situation uh, this afternoon. It's the framework and, uh, of these uh, short presentations where we can't really say uh, much... Uh, meaningful, but, um, and I did appreciate um, uh, you trying to uh, position this uh, uh, complexity or, or different trends, though I would like to criticize the binary uh, opposition of, of these two. At one point you even said the modern Austrian 
and then the peasants radical. And, and there is a problem in these uh, binaries because uh, what is modern? Everything is modern. And uh, if you look, uh, the, just one example, radicals advocated and, and, uh, and eventually established the full suffrage. Um, so in most of the terms we consider suffrage as a modern uh, uh, aspect of uh, society. And, uh, and the pro-Austrians um, and Austria itself was not modern in that respect. And if we look at Austria, we have at the same time uh, Sigmund Freud, or we have Austria as the birthplace of modern anti-Semitism. But if we look at the funeral arrangements of uh, Franz Ferdinand and, and Sophie Chotek, we see that Austria is probably the most backward or conservative society in Europe at that time. So the picture is more complex than any binaries we can, uh, we might project. Thank you. Someone behind you, Ron. Uh, Conor Kleving from Regensburg. Uh, my two questions go mainly to Professor Samardzic. Um, how would we measure, in the first place, responsibility or irresponsibility in, in actors acting in that period? Um, and the second thing is, was Serbia really not going to plan to go, uh, wasn't Serbia planning to go to war on Austria in the long run? Uh, and I would like to give reason to my questions. Um, I would dare to say that the political elites in Austria-Hungary felt deeply provoked by Serbian behavior uh, and had felt so for years, uh, at least from, from the Bosnian annexation crisis. Um, we had that slide by the colleague from Slovakia on Jovan Cvijic, and he, for example, wrote so strongly anti-Austrian after the, at the Bosnian annexation crisis and after uh, that Austrian representatives in Belgrade had reasons by this example and other examples to suppose that Serbia was preparing to aggressively attack the empire. On the other hand, um, was it irresponsible by, by the Serbian elite and army to prepare for war? I don't know. The, the situation in the Balkans were very uh, instable and they had their it, it was a reasonable reasoning to, to think that you need a strong army in that situation and then you need to be prepared for war and for going into war. Um, whereas, the second question, whereas um, the, the, the government didn't have plans to go to, into war in, in 1914, that's for sure. That's, uh, um, again, uh, weren't there plans to go to war on Bosnia in the longer run, if you read what the what elite members wrote about it. And Marco Atelahor presented the Apis faction as one of the two power centers of the empire, uh, of, the, of Serbia. So if the, the assault on, the, on Franz Ferdinand came from one of the two power centers, I mean, that, that is really a provocation. Um, of the other part. And it wasn't that it was just an everyday uh, experience to have your prince heritage assaulted on the street. So it did have a meaning. And in the broader picture, of course, it was France, it was uh, Germany, and everybody else. But it was not by chance that the war started here. Okay, thank you. Of course, we cannot measure responsibility or irresponsibility. But I'm not sure that we should measure everything that was happening in the past, even if we are able. Um, I think that uh, everybody was irresponsible because uh, no, nobody really could predict what will happen. And even while entering into war, the big powers thought that uh, the war will be short and victorious. Uh, 
On the other side, you, you raised a, a very uh, important question, and uh, it's uh, on the Austrian policy. In, uh, uh, in Serbia, and, and also uh, we should mention very strong anti-Serbian feelings that arose in, in, in Vienna and uh, other European capitals uh, after the 20, 28th of June. Uh, also, we, we should consider uh, the French and, and the Russian influence on Serbia after uh, 1903 that uh, led uh, the Serbian official policy and public uh, opinion into, uh, into, into collision, into uh, a war with, uh, with Austria. Uh, I, I must notice here that uh, uh, very much was seated uh, is not Chaitanya, etc., etc. I'm not sure if uh, much of contemporaries were really reading that paper, and that was mostly it. It, it was a plagiarism because it was a, a Polish similar article translated into into, into Serbian. It, it it was not an original genuine Serbian program, uh, but most important was the press and cafes where people were sitting and, and, uh, and, discussing, and discussing policy. Uh, also was very important uh, the dynasty change in 1903. Although there were parts of Serbia very pro brenovic orientated, uh, they were very popular in, 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 in certain parts of Serbia. And you even have uh, contemporary Serbian families that uh, claim they are pro brenovic orientated, but uh, they, are, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are very few. If uh, Serbia was preparing uh, to war with, with Austria, I, I'm not too sure. And uh, the Serbian government was very uh, unstable, weak and confused in months that were preceding uh, uh, the, the war. The army was politically strong, but also not prepared for the war. If you measure the, uh, the casualties in Serbia in First World War, you will conclude that irresponsibility could be measured by, uh, by, by these facts. Thank you. Um, so I'll just sort of, to sort of um, respond to, to Boyan's uh, uh, point. Um, no, I didn't want to sort of claim that the radical party was my anti-modern or that sort of the, um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was representing modernity. What I was saying was something a bit different, which is that the, the, the Serbian revolutions or the Serbian uprisings had given rise to a sort of new a Serbian elite, which was sort of following sort of European styles, and that was seen by peasantry as both as oppressive in terms of its... Um, exploitation, but also as kind of something culturally alien. And the radical party itself kind of gave a sort of a voice to this peasant opposition. Um, the radical party was, you know, a modern political party. You know, it, they, they weren't sort of, if you like, men just from, from the woods. They weren't, weren't, they weren't men from the woods. Um, this was kind of a sort of uh, a modern, initially revolutionary party, which stopped the kind of Jac Jacobinical model of sort of national, extreme national sovereignty. Uh, the nation won and um, indivisible. Uh, but it sort of drew upon this kind of peasant or sort of conservative opposition to the sort of Serbian, the new Serbian elite that had arisen uh, during the 19th, the 19th uh, century. And this ideology of, sort of Svetozor Markovic, who was kind of like since the ideological sort of forerunner of the radicals, um, did consciously view uh, the event, sort of social differentiation that had taken place during the 19th century, the sort of modernization of Serbia along capitalist lines, as a source of, of corruption for Serbia, so he sort of sped them up, which kind of idealized traditional Serbian society and sort of saw development of modern capitalism as bringing sort of debauchery and drunkenness and sort of corruption stemming, stemming from the towns. Um, now, of course, the Radical Party was a sort of modern party and had to kind of reconcile these different, these different trends. So, um, you know, it wasn't by any means, they weren't by any means opposed to all forms of economic uh, um, development. I mean, in some sense, they were more interested in sometimes protecting Serbian industry than the more overtly pro Austrians or progressive party were, I mean, they never let, they say, did kind of form a kind of uh, give some sort of voice to peasant discontent with this sort of modern, new, uh, sort of Euro Europeanized um, elite. 
and at the same time, so they had to sort of the radicals had to kind of reconcile these, these conflicting traditions, and they did sort of try and, and do so. And in terms of this question of suffrage, I'd also note that the, the radical party was, after the First World War, opposed to sort of female female suffrage. So they represented the kind of opposition to the full emancipation of women. So I couldn't really accept that they were fully modern in, in that respect either. But I certainly don't want to sort of present, you know, sort of a simplistic picture of backward radicals versus modern modern pro pro Austrians. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, if I may just to uh, uh, build upon the the words uh, said by <coughs> Professor uh, uh, the the question of the of the Serbia's uh, willingness to enter the war as, as you as you've uh, asked uh, I, I also think that we we have to consider uh, the fact that uh, the Serbia was in the in the condition uh, and time when they faced three wars within the the very uh, well uh, maybe uh, uh, short time three wars which had uh, a great impact on the on the army and the, the, the whole society so that's that's one point uh, which is very important to to answer uh, if we if we talk about the, the, their well responsibility or willingness to uh, to enter the, the war and the, the position of Serbia uh, Serbia towards the, 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 the war uh, itself and then uh, uh, it's uh, very necessary or it's it's a very good source to to answer and to to seek the the answers that uh, is the uh, an analysis of Serbian uh, uh, telegraphs with for example uh, Russian uh, foreign ministry uh, when they when they asked if it's if it's uh, if it's okay uh, or what should, what should we do because it, it was very uh, it was very complicated for for Serbia and and, and we can we can see uh, we can see the results of uh, of this so it, I think it's the the most important uh, uh, if we want to uh, want uh, partially ask uh, ask uh, well answer this question, it's the the, the analysis of, of, of these documents. I, I, I suppose it was Gail Stokes who who made uh, who made uh, uh, a very good research on on that point. So it's just my uh, remark on that. <coughs> I, I want to quote uh, again, Mr. Nikola Pašić, Serbian Prime Minister. In 1913, he wrote a letter to uh, Mr. Uh, Svetozar Pribicevic, the leader of the uh, <coughs> Croatian-Serbian coalition in Zagreb. And in this letter, he suggested to him to uh, have a peaceful policy towards Hungarian government, because Serbia is not ready for a new war conflict. Hello. Um, I would like to direct my question to all of the panelists or whoever wants to answer. Um, a lot has been said on who is at fault for World War I, um, and it's usually treated as a failure in international affairs and diplomacy. My question is, if it was not for technology, if it wasn't for barbed wire for machine guns or tanks, would World War I be known as the War of 1914 and maybe have several thousand casualties rather than several million? 
And if so, do you think that maybe we're putting too much blame on diplomacy and international affairs? Is this really the first instance of technology backfiring on us? And what implications does that have in the age of information going forward? Thanks. Well, to sort of begin with, with, with the first question, I think um, Mustafa Golubic was certainly um, one of the members of the circle who were kind of in, in the background of a Sarajevo assassination, and he had those links with, with Russian um, intelligence. So, I mean, the, the, sort of the, the point to remember is that, is that these countries weren't simply homogenous wholes. We don't talk about some Russia as being one, one voice or one sort of uh, one opinion. In a sense, there were different power centers and different factions, elements working as sort of, uh, sort of loggerheads uh, with, with each other. It's, it's not that Russia actually wanted war at that, at that point, um, but there were certain elements who were sort of, in fact, were agitating for it. So this uh, von Hartwig, the, the, the Russian sort of uh, ambassador in Serbia, was one of those people who was sort of pushing for a more uh, aggressive policy uh, and, and by Serbia. So I mean, just to sort of respond to the last question, I'd say perhaps um, this is you know something which Christopher Clark and I mentioned in his book, which is. Um, the most recent sort of conference of study, the outbreak of the war, and um, stresses in some sense it was a sort of in some sense not not fully more modern war because you did have these diplomats in different sections of the state working at variance with one, with one another, um, and this misunderstandings between different, these different sections contributed to, to, to the outbreak of war. So, in some sense, it was still not a fully modern modern war um, in, in that respect. Uh, greetings to all. Uh, my name is Amela Hadjelic. I have a question for Professor Sanardic. Uh, everybody is referring to the assassination as the assassination, so my question is why do you use the term Sarajevo accident? Can you please elaborate? I use it literally. Sorry. If that, that, uh, if you it was a hallucination. It, it was not a terrorist attack because the one who had to be murdered was murdered. In terrorist attacks, uh, are, uh, you have random victims. Yeah. yeah, necessarily there are random victims, by definition. Uh, hello, my name is Sabina Veladic. Uh, I'm from Institute in Sarajevo. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is the right time or place to give a comment on last night's question, uh, provocative question, uh, whether more knowledge will lead to reconciliation. Uh, I say I'm not sure this is the right place and time, but I would like to ask who and how will define what objective knowledge is? And can we say that objective knowledge in a naive manner speaking is maybe illusion? Since these days we have developed market of different interpretations that are recognized as those subjective but true. Are these different perspectives and different interpretations are recognized as knowledge. And also I would like to give a comment on Maros. Uh, I saw uh, one sentence in your text that uh, Serbia aspirations toward Bosnia was in a sense, uh, it was written like natural aspiration. Maybe not word aspiration. Should we as historians use this word natural? in this organic, <laughs> ideological sense. And also would like to give uh, one comment. Uh, I believe that official uh, name and nomination of our language is Bosnian, not Bosniak. That's all, thank you. Okay. 
maybe uh, I, I didn't use the, the, the right word as I, as I wrote natural, maybe uh, reasonable would be uh, quite, quite better, but uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the one important point uh, of my presentation was that uh, I really wanted to to show the, the relationships and the visions of, of, of Serbs towards Bosnia and Herzegovina in the, in the scope of 19th century. I didn't want to, uh, you know, watch through my eyes uh, in no nowadays in 21st century, which is uh, absolutely uh, different and uh, it's uh, different in its, uh, in its pure concept, in, in, in its essence. So. Uh, it's it's uh, important uh, to uh, uh, elaborate uh, also the, the mentioned programs which were uh, created during the, the 19th century uh, as a product of, of 19th century. It's it's very complicated if we uh, if we try to compare it with, with, with nowadays and uh, and uh, you know issues we and and the knowledge and uh, everything which is. Uh, which is available uh, for us for us now. So, so maybe uh, as, as your comment, uh, uh, it, it was also it was uh, it was written uh, through the uh, eyes of of uh, of uh, Serbs in, in 19th century. So it was the uh, this concept was uh, was very very often and it it, it appeared in in, uh, in nearly in nearly every. Every program elaborated as I as I uh, uh, it was it was uh, well I would say natural but uh, it was uh, it was uh, normal in in those days to to perceive it as as natural so that's that's my my uh, comment on it. Ovo je samo na moment, dobar dan, pozdravljam, ovo je Sonja Dujmović, institut istorije. Ovaj, pošto se osjećam kova u kod kuće, ja ću sjesti i ovaj govoriti svojim mjeskom. Ovaj, htjela bi samo komentarisati ovaj diskusiju, ukratko, a, to je jedno, jedna stvar, da li, obzirom da su bosanski srbi bili bez formalne podrške, da su onda krenuli sa, na saradnju u srbijanskim strukturama a, prema tajnim udruženjima. Ja mislim, odnosno, da li su u stvari srbijanske strukture imale s kim da razgovaraju u Bosni i Hercegovini? Znači, da li je postojala struktura u Bosni i Hercegovini s kojim bi zvančna Srbija usvojena kao nastojanjima za neku zaštiju interesa Srba u Bosni i Hercegovini mogla da razgovara? Mislim da je to vrlo upitno pitanje, da u stvari te izgrađene strukture nije ni bilo Govorimo o 19. vijeku i u momentima od načrtanja pa nadalje. Ako ova dosadašnja historiografija govori s kim je u stvari moglo se sarađivati, mi vidimo jednu šaroliku strukturu, šaroliko društvo koje uključuje čak ne samo srpe, nego i hrvate, odnosno katoličko stanovništvo, odnosno hranjevce, tačnije, a sa srpske neke sa neke pravoslavne, pa ili tako, provenijence više, to su trgovci u koje čak i te neke strukture koje žele saradnju sa Srbijom i Srbije sa Bosnom ne vjeruju. Oni su vrlo sumljiva kategorija, promjenljiva, vrlo interesna, tako da se u stvari trebalo sačekati jedna intelektualna, jedna nacionalno svjesna i jedna, kako bi rekla, gotova za saradnju baza i struktura s kojom bi u stvari moglo da se ovaj sarađuje. Znači nije bilo vlasnik te kritične mase koja je u stvari mogla da nosi i da odgovori na možda ili ponudu ili na odbijanje od strane Srbije. Znači to je vrijeme koje mi samo projeciramo kao neku totalnu oformljenu grupu koja ovdje funkcioniše u nekom srpskom smislu, tako dalje. Mi je trebalo samo sjetimo, kjer 852. je u stvari 
u Sarajevu ili tako, ovaj, na Malti, pravoslavnom stanovništu koji su sebe nazivali rišćani, govore, vi niste rišćani, vi ste srbi. Znači, to je, ovaj, na to treba računati, to je vrlo kratko vrijeme. E, I na kim u stvari, te tajne organizacije sarađuju u Bosni, krajem 19. stoljeća, to su stvari trgovci koji imaju neki interes tamo u Srbiji. Ne znam, to su neke strukture koje su, to su mladi svijet. I uopće nema izgrađene interaktualne strukture. Mi moramo e, računati s tim da koji je broj u stvari studenata završenih, ne znam, 1902. kad se osjetnila srtko, recimo, pred, ovaj, kulturno društvo prosjeta za, za, za podržavanje ovaj, studiranja. Da znam, I to je to intelektualna intelita koja je u stvari formirana u Austro-Gerskoj. Za sad, hvala vam na Elmoku i Aleksu. Ja mogu da dopunim ovo pitanje i apsolutno se slažem sa Sonjom, a bitno je zbog razumevanja uloge ovih tajnih udruženja, jer upravo Austrija svojom upravom ne dozvoljava nastajanje i formiranje legitimnih političkih predstavnika Srba u ovom periodu i kao alternativu uvodi nešto što se naziva Habsburgski ili Jozefinski konfesionalizam, znači za legitimne predstavnike Srba, a i Hrvata i bosanskih muslimana, nameće njihove verske lidere. Ti verski lideri su svi lojalni, pro-Habsburgski orijentisani i predstavljaju interese krune, a ne svojih vernika. I to je glavni problem tokom čitavog perioda austrijske dominacije koje se tek delimično nakon smrti Kalaja i nakon promjena delimično menja. Tako da to objašnjava zašto se pojavljuju i trgovci i tajna udruženja, a onda i ovi mladići, ubice ili teroristi. Zato što taj koji treba da predstavlja interese Srba, on se ovdje zove u Sarajevu Evgenije Letica i on drži 303 metra veliku portret Franje Josifa u svoj spavaćoj sobi. Evo tome se radi. Zdravka Elaska, Marijan, Hrvatski institut za povijest. Htjela bi profesore Samarđića zapravo zamoliti za jedno pojašnjenje, odnosno neke usporedbe. Dosta je recimo zadnje vrijeme popularno raspravljati o tome je li Sarajevski atentat teroristički čin ili nije. Vi ste se opredijelili za ovu interpretaciju kojoj se radi o ubistvu koji nije ujedno i teroristički čin, bare nije u onom modernom smislu koje odrazumijeva mnogo civilnih žrtava. Međutim, atentati tog vremena su mahom drugačiji. Sad me zanima da li smatrate da se na isti način onda može interpretirati i ubistvo carice Sisi ili nešto kasnijem razdoblju ubistvo kralja Aleksandra u Marseju, da li biste na isti način onda se postavili prema VMRO kao prema Crnoj ruci. Evo, zahvaljam. I think that there are similarities. One difference is between the assassination of King Aleksandra Branović and his wife in 1903 that was a really savage act and uh, uh, among the murderers were some of the distinguished members of uh, of, uh, of Belgrade uh, local elites and that's how this uh, this murder was uh, uh, a very special among uh, uh, all these others uh, if it's a terrorist act 
or not, it is also a question that uh, uh, embraces uh, the points of view, the dif different points of view, and they may be also legitimate uh, while interpret interpreting uh, what was happening uh, a century ago. Because uh, we, we are not here gathered to to draw any final conclusions because we are not historians uh, in, uh, as, met, met, as mathematicians or physicians. We are not drawing uh, any natural laws. So it's also uh, everything uh, due to interpretation. But uh, what I wanted to remark here and what we can think about during this conference is uh, why we are watching the Serbian-Bosnian relations in one way. Because you have Bosnians in Serbia uh, living for centuries as Bosnians. Is a Begovic family, is, I, I think, from Belgrade, and and they came from from, from Serbia too. So, if if you ask uh, whether we should consider any any national policy from that era as uh, as natural, well. We are a kind of same people if we are not the same nation or nationality or if we don't speak the same language, although we do speak the same language but uh, with, 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 with different names. So I think it's, uh, it's very complicated because you have bosses that, that, uh, that, that live in Serbia but uh, you lack uh, a Bosnian policy in, uh, at that era because you like a, a Bosnian state at, at, at that era. That, that's why Serbs are active in, in Bosnia. Uh, it's, it's why you have so much uh, Serbian writers and poets uh, who due their appearance to, 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 to the Austrian rule. Austrian rule was autocratic but uh, was um, also enlightening. So o Austria helped Serbs to, uh, to raise the national questions and lead to uh, the, the first, first World Conflict. I, I cited Petr Kocic, who, who was uh, um, a very active anti-Austrian uh, anti, anti promoter. And uh, we, we all learned his... Uh, 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 his short story, Badger, right, uh, as, a, as a scene from, from an Austrian court, which was invented because Austrian courts were uh, much more efficient than, uh, than any other court, court, court in the region, etc., etc., etc. So it's, it's very complicated, and I should not watch the Serbian Bosnian relation as, as, one, way, as one way direction. Although uh, the one that was leading to Serbian aspirations to Bosnia was uh, much more important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Ahmed Nametak. Uh, I come from Institute of Sarajevo and I will express my thoughts about uh, this conference and the uh, expose of the esteemed colleagues. If you, if you don't mind, I'll sit. <clears throat> in my opinion, uh, we have two big issues in uh, research of this great war. Uh, when I was, uh, in, uh, when I was uh, attending the conference in Vienna earlier this year, uh, I noticed that uh, Western historians that come from the, uh, across the ocean do not, uh, uh, if I may say, understand the complexity of inter-ethnic uh, relations between the people uh, that live here. Uh, that's one problem. Uh, the second thing uh, is that I have a feeling 
that whatever uh, uh, we try and whatever we try to appear objective, I must say that I noticed that uh, the background of researchers and historians inevitably influence their thoughts and what they said here. Uh, and this, uh, deba this debate here uh, proved that 100% uh, in my opinion. Uh, I must say that, for example, uh, Mr. Samardzic, who I appreciate very much, uh, when he said in uh, 1877 uh, that uh, Turkish crews uh, left Belgrade and uh, Serbian cities, he, he missed to say that uh, much of the civilian population also left at that time. So I think uh, we must try... I don't want to say this as a critic, but we must try to... to uh, we must try to uh, make a distance and to try to look uh, and uh, try to uh, be more objective. I'm not saying this as a critique to anyone specific, but as a... Uh, histor histor historians at, uh, as in general. Thank you. No, the most of the civilians left long before. Um, when uh, Serbian uprisers in 1806 entered into Belgrade, they started killing everyone, not asking who nations they were, because they were all in, in Turkish robes. And they, them as peasants considered every citizen as, as, as an enemy. So it was not my topic. And I'm not so sure if nationality really matters. I mean, I, I think you are exaggerating. I'm mean, just sort of to go back to some of the points which were raised earlier by, by, by Sonia and, and others. I mean, this, um, I think it's important to remember that this uh, assassination um, was the work of fringe elements and that among the Bosnian elites before the First World War was a broad acceptance of Habsburg rules. So you say, generally speaking, that the, the, the uh, Bosniaks and Croats broadly accept this and even the, the Serbs, Serb elites were sort of accepting it. And there was a sort of tendency towards as so a movement for Bosnian autonomy and sort of pushing for autonomy with Bosnia uh, within the Habsburg Empire. Um, nevertheless, it was a, a world away from that and the sort of extreme extremism that sort of manifested in, in the assassination. And so this sort of uh, young Bosnian network itself was kind of a sort of amorphous, sort of ill-defined uh, group. Um, and it was a sort of a, a sort of kind of constituency in which you could sort of um, the black hand could find these recruits ready to carry out carry out assass assassination. Um, but you know, it was it was a sense. It was a fringe movement. It did not represent, represent any kind of uh, expression of the Bosnian Serb, let alone general Bosnian desire for national for national liberation. That, in, that, in, that, in that respect, so I think you have to bear that in mind. It was a work of, of fringe elements, not representing the Bosnian national struggle or the Bosnian elites. Any other questions? I think, I think that uh, <coughs> we can finish our session with a great satisfaction. I think that it was a, a very interesting discussion. And uh, after this, uh, it will be a coffee break. To, it was uh, from uh, 11, but we will finish 10 minutes before, but it's not a problem. Thank you very much for, for us.